Hello, I'm Roger Bisbee from the Skill Builder channel and in this video I want to talk to you about some important changes which are going to take place in the UK building industry over the next 12 months or so. Now before I get into the details of these changes I just want to have a little rant. Now the Skill Builder channel has got a global reach and I'm very happy to see that and that means we get lots of lovely comments from people all over the world concerning the videos that we put up. One thing we get quite a lot is people saying I can't believe that in Britain people were still living in such crappy houses. It's like you're living in the Stone Age, a drafted, a badly insulated, etc. etc. And it particularly rankles with me when those people happen to be Germans, or in the case last week, I had a Swedish guy going on saying, You guys shouldn't be living in such rubbish homes, what's wrong with you? Well, I just felt compelled to give him a little history lesson because in the last century, Britain spent a huge amount of money and expended a huge number of lives fighting two wars with Germany. Now, wars cost money. They don't only cost people, they cost money. And we had to borrow the money to pay to fight those wars. Now, it may surprise some of you to know that we didn't actually finish paying that debt off until 2005. So that meant that for most of my work in life, I was paying taxes to pay off that debt from the Second World War and even the First World War. So that takes a lot to recover from. We were in bad need of housing and that housing had to be built quickly and cheaply with hardly any money. And of course, materials were on ration. There was also under license, which meant that if you built a new house, you had to build it with minimal materials, which is why we often find that houses built around that era have three by two roof rafters rather than a four by two or something even bigger. So that's the history lesson over and done with, and let's now look to the future. One of the proposals that the government is making is that new homes will no longer just have a 10-year warranty, but will have a mandatory 15-year warranty. Now, this is going to be an insurance back thing, as it is at the moment with either local authority building control warranty scheme or NHPC or any of the other schemes that are around, but it will mean that the builders are actually compelled, mandated to provide that warranty. But of course, if you tried to get a mortgage on a new home that didn't have a warranty, you'd find that very difficult. But of course, having that extra five years warranty on structural defects does give consumers a greater protection. And I personally think it's a great thing. But of course, this legislation has come off the back of the Grenfell tragedy, where it was seen that a lot of people were living in high rise buildings with unsafe cladding, which had to be replaced. And of course, it had gone outside of the warranty period. So the question is, who paid? Everybody was wiping their hands off. Now, giving it an extra five years still means that you've got to discover those faults within those extra five years. But what they're saying is, is far more likely. But I would say that probably structural defects are going to raise their ugly head within the first five years of a building. But of course, there will be things that come to light, like missing fire stops and so on, which will now be covered under this new 15 year warranty. And I will just mention that if you're a self builder and you intend to live in your home, there is no requirement for you to have a warranty on that home. But if you intend to sell it within 15 years, then you will need a warranty and you will find it very difficult to pick up a warranty halfway through. In other words, if you decided you're going to live in a home for a seven and a half years and then you were going to sell it and you tried to get yourself a warranty for the remaining bit, you would find it almost impossible. So when we look at these warranty schemes, as I say, all insurance backed. We mustn't forget that the developer also has a warranty period. The first two years of any new home are covered by the developer's warranty. And if the developer should go bankrupt shortly after building the property, say within those two years, the insurance backed warranty would take over the liability. So a question a lot of you will be wondering is what is a structural defect? What does this insurance actually cover? Well, it would cover things like leaking roofs, for example if we found that a, a roof was leaking either through poor workmanship or by inferior materials or some problem with a tile, say, then that will be covered under your structural defects warranty. But if the roof blew off in a hurricane, then that wouldn't be covered and you'd have to go to your household insurance to cover that, except in the case where the builder has failed to put in the necessary clips and other secondary fixings, like you're supposed to nail every tile or mechanically fix every tile if it's a large format tile now. And if that hasn't been done and the roof blows off, then the builder or the insurance company would be liable for that. 
And it would also include my old friend rising damp. But given the fact that houses now have a damp proof course as a mandatory thing, then rising damp is very unlikely to occur. But you can get penetrating damp. And if a house is built in a particularly exposed location and the driving rain is coming through and appearing on the inside of the wall in damp patches, then that would be covered under a structural defects warranty. So all this new legislation is actually under the umbrella of the Building Safety Act, but of course it allows them to just amend it and add new clauses and new bits to the legislation without actually going back through Parliament. So you can expect to see it tweaked and upgraded and all sorts of things introduced into there under that umbrella. And you could argue that things like penetrating damp, for example, aren't really a safety hazard, but hey, they've got it. We also have something else which is coming up, which is the future home standard. As of 2024, we're gonna to have to start looking at putting new measures into buildings to ensure that they can be 27% more carbon efficient, if you like, emitting less carbon into the atmosphere and that is going to be done with an aim towards as we transition towards green energy 100% green electricity if you like that those homes will automatically become carbon neutral now it sounds like a great idea and i've actually got nothing against having warmer more energy efficient homes i think that's a great thing one of the big mistakes was trying to put this technology into older houses and of course a lot of the changes are going to be around getting low temperature heating systems into our building so we can use heat pumps rather than gas boilers and also move away from direct electricity heating i.e. just radiators and things like that, towards heat pumps. Now there is an argument here that says that if you're moving towards 100% green electricity and you've got a small well insulated house, for example in a flat or a, an apartment, then there's really no need for you to go to the trouble of having a heat pump and all that entails. You can simply put in some off-peak storage radiators and heat the building like that. I mean you'll still be carbon neutral. But of course, one of the reasons why they don't want to do this is because of yet another elephant in the room. I mean, you can't move in this room for elephants now. And that is the fact that the national grid will not be able to cope with all houses being on electricity and heating their homes directly from the electricity. The national grid would just collapse. We just simply wouldn't have enough power stations. We wouldn't have enough in the infrastructure. And if you add electric vehicles to the equation, we just won't be able to do it. So it's all very well bringing about this legislation and these changes, but we have to try and move technology forward in tandem rather than one bit at a time. And of course, insulation, as I've said before, is not only about keeping heat in, it's about keeping heat out. And that's become a very big issue. They're now going to propose new homes are cooler as well as warmer. In other words, they're not going to suffer from the solar gain in the same way that some older homes do. And therefore, air conditioning will be less of a requirement because at the moment, a lot of people are looking at putting in heat pumps, which are split systems so that they can heat during the winter and they can call during the summer. And a lot of, again, overseas visitors say, can't understand why you guys don't use split systems. Well, a simple answer is that the government is very much against any kind of heat pump which has a cooling capacity. And of course, they don't want us to double our electricity consumption while we're still relying on gas and nuclear power stations to provide a lot of our electricity. So what they are proposing is things like passive cooling systems and ways of providing shade from the heat. So there's a lot to look at there and on skill building we will be returning to this subject and of course please leave your comments below I'd love to discuss this with you there's a lot to discuss there and we will also endeavor to provide you with free information on all those new health and safety changes so that you can meet the new requirements without having to shell out loads and loads of money for literature and training courses because at the moment building workers are going to be made to pay to access that information and I think that's a bit of a scandal